I was halfway through Bolivia when my Marine buddy Tim called. Charlie is dead, he said. No context required. We'd gotten to know Charlie in sniper school. He was a special operations Marine, and I spent the majority of sniper school in awe of him. He was a machine, invincible. He died in an ambush, Tim said. I'd later learned that he'd been shot through his lung while rushing forward to save some wounded Afghan allies. He'd still managed to drag the Afghans to safety. Later, his Silver Star citation would state that he fought ferociously until his final breath. He was a warrior after all, he'd always said. And what do warriors do if they don't fight wars? Charlie bled to death on some meaningless Afghanistan mountainside. Meanwhile, when I received the news, I was half a world away drinking Pisco Sours in the Andes, my Marine Corps uniform taken off for the last time three months prior. I felt a touch of shame. My girlfriend, Indra, who was with me, had never known Charlie, so she couldn't join me in mourning. It was my first suspicion that, now, no longer in the Marines, I'd forever be grieving alone. I wasn't truly alone. Indra and I were fast in love, and back home in Iowa, I had two supportive parents and three sisters. They were always there for me, eager to support in any way possible. But the reality was those people, who knew me better than anyone, no longer understood me. Iraq and Afghanistan had changed me. I was one of the lucky ones. After four years of war, the tattoos on my shoulder and arm were the only scars of combat I bore. So many men I served with had come home with real scars. Scars that proved their commitment and sacrifice. Dozens came home in flag-draped coffins. Their sacrifice would never be in doubt. Had I done enough? My decision to get out of the Marines was complicated. My deployments with the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, 27, to Iraq and Afghanistan were challenging, and our unit took some of the highest casualties of both wars in 2007 and 2008. I was proud of my service, but became conflicted about our progress toward a mission I couldn't easily define. The sense of urgency to go and fight our nation's enemies in foreign lands waned as I found myself in firefights with disenfranchised youth as often as with radical ideologues. Nonetheless, my sense of duty compelled me to consider re-enlisting and going back overseas. After some quiet reflection, I decided that I didn't want war to define my life, and I chose to leave the Marine Corps on my own terms, rather than in a box escorted home on an empty cargo plane. Though I knew I no longer wanted to be in the fight, I wasn't entirely sure what to do next. I took the standardized test for graduate business school programs and scored well, so I applied to some top MBA programs with the hope that two years of school would give me some time and space to figure things out. After finishing my applications and anxious to put Iraq and Afghanistan in my rearview mirror, I disappeared to South America with Indra. We crisscrossed the continent in planes, trains, and automobiles, immersing ourselves in history and culture. I relished not having to wonder if the foreign-speaking men and women smiling at me in restaurants were only being kind and generous because of the assault rifle strapped across my chest or the missile-laden jets I could call overhead. Yet the trip left me wondering if I was truly ready to become a civilian, especially after learning that Charlie was dead. Part of me missed having that rifle. Back home in Los Angeles, I peeled off my damp gym clothes. I had the apartment to myself. Indra co-anchored the morning news program at KABC Los Angeles and was a rising star in broadcast meteorology. Even as a young child, Indra knew she wanted to predict the weather and had spent her whole life in pursuit of that career. I admired her singular pursuit of that dream. I was 27 years old and, no longer Marine, totally unsure what to do with my life. Outwardly, I projected confidence that after business school I would launch into a successful career, but inwardly, I doubted I would ever find what Indra had, a job that felt like it was what I was put on this earth to do. I turned on the TV and waited for the audio to come to life as I returned to the kitchen. Hunched over three frying eggs, I heard the first hint that my typical morning was about to take a turn. 